Okay, well, it is a joy to be with you this evening and share with you from God's precious word. And I'd like you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Genesis and chapter 16, Genesis chapter 16. And over the next uh, four uh, Tuesday evenings, uh, what I'd like to do is speak a little bit about the wells of Scripture. And of course, we're not going to be able to do every one of them because there are lots of different incidents that took place in the Bible at wells, and we'll, but we'll at least consider some of them and some of the lessons that we can learn uh, concerning the wells of Scripture. And so the first uh, one I want to begin reading in Genesis 16 and verse 7, and I'm going to read to verse 14, although we will uh, indeed consider the entire chapter because we need some necessary background to this incident, but uh, this is the main incident I want us to consider, beginning in verse 7, it says this, and the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou, God, seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Beer Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And again, God will bless that reading of the word of God to us this evening. And so as we consider the idea of wells in scripture, I always find whenever I'm studying any topic, it's always good to begin with the principle of first mention, uh, when the first mention of wells are in the Bible. And of course, as you would expect, the first mention of many things is found in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. We have the first mention of love there. We have the first mention of peace there. We have the first mention of worship there. Uh, it's filled with first mentions. And usually when a, a word is used for the first time, it seems to carry that character throughout the whole word of God. It may get embellished a little bit. It might, may have additional information, but it still retains its original character all the way through. This uh, chapter <clears throat> has another first mention as well, not just the first mention of a well, but it also is the first time that we'll see the angel of the Lord mentioned as appearing to men. And so it's not without significance that the angel of the Lord appears to a woman in the deepest distress and a woman who is an outcast and he appears to her. And now the reason that is significant, the angel of the Lord appearing to this outcast woman uh, who um, was a foreigner, she's an Egyptian, as we learn, and yet he went to this distressed outcast woman and has a message for her. When we get to the New Testament, the first time a well is mentioned in the New Testament is another woman in distress and disillusioned, and uh, she's at a well in the well of Sychar. And again, uh, not, not the pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus, but actually the Lord Jesus, God manifest in flesh, appears to her and has a message for her as well. And so again, we just see the kind of interesting uh, how these fit together. Ironically, as we're on this subject of first mention, second mention, or first mention in New Testament, first mention in the Old Testament, one of the things I often find interesting is, what about the last mention? And the last mention of wells in the New Testament is in a little epistle called Jude. And it tells us that there are false teachers, and they are wells without 
water. In other words, they have nothing to satisfy, nothing to uh, soothe, nothing to refresh, nothing to, nothing to give. And so it's just an interesting thing just to even consider how these wells are mentioned in the word of God. And of course, part of the reason these false teachers are wells without water, because often in the Bible, wells, and we'll see this as we proceed uh, throughout this study, that wells are quite symbolic of either the word of God or the spirit of God. Because again, our refreshment spiritually, <laughs> where does that come from? Well, it talks about the washing of the water of the word in Ephesians chapter five, doesn't it? The spirit of God out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So often uh, the, the symbolism behind the well is either speaking of the word of God or the spirit of God. And without getting overly technical, it seems like when it's still water, it's the word of God. And when it is uh, active water, like a fountain, it's the spirit of God. But, but it's interesting how they're both together, really, because when we think of the word of God, what makes the word of God so refreshing, so special to our souls is that it is the inspired word of God and holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So really, this book is so different because it's the book that the Holy Spirit has moved men to write. And so, again, brings that refreshment to weary souls. And so these false teachers they cannot, even though oftentimes women, <laughs> we read in, in the epistles of Timothy, women uh, go trying to find some soothing for their condition uh, to these false teachers, and they can't give them any because not only do they not have the spirit, these false teachers, but they've also contaminated the word of God by adding their errors into the word of God and in some way diluting its effectiveness. So <clears throat> both these women here, uh, Hagar, the New Testament, the woman at the well of Sychar, were women that needed a message that would encourage them in their distress, that would refresh them, that would change them, that would help them. And of course, that message comes from the word of God and by the spirit of God uh, to their hearts. So just having said that by way of introduction, I want to just kind of see the background to this well incident that we've just read from verse 7. So I'd like you to go to verse 1. And of course, Genesis 16 records a very painful detour that Abraham and Sarah made in their pilgrim uh, walk, a walk of faith with the Lord. A detour that brought conflict not only to their own home, and it would bring conflict into the family circle, but it would also bring conflict into the world that we know today as the Arab-Israeli conflict, right? It's going to have its origins right here in this chapter. And it's all because Abraham and Sarah made some decisions, sold some seeds here that were going to reap a harvest in their family life and also in their national life as the descendants of Abraham would find to this very hour. And it all began with impatience on the part of Sarah. And that's a challenge for all of us, isn't it? Because we're always in a hurry. I don't know about you, but I'm always, I want things now or, or even yesterday. And the hardest thing I find as a child of God is to wait patiently on the Lord. Now, maybe I'm the only one that has that issue, but I suspect it's common to all of us, right? And we find it very difficult to wait. And there's a tendency for us to take matters into our own hands if we don't see an immediate answer from the Lord. And so that's really the background here. And so it tells us that Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare him no children. And she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Now, of course, the question is, where did she get this Egyptian handmaid? Well, it was another one of the lapses of faith of Abraham, the great father of the faithful. And if you look back to chapter 12 and verse 10, uh, we read uh, that uh, there was, verse 10, it says, uh, chapter 12, there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down 
into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And of course, lots of things happened there. He took Lot with him, and Lot got a taste uh, for Egyptian life. And so that was going to affect his decisions as to where he would go when they returned to the promised land and where he would end up locating. But notice verse 16. It says, and he had entreated Abraham well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And so it would seem that Abraham was treated well for Sarah's sake, because remember that uh, Pharaoh had taken Sarah into his harem. And so <clears throat> part of that treatment included giving to Abraham sheep, oxen, asses, men servants, and maid servants. And there's a strong possibility that Hagar was part of Pharaoh's gifting to Abraham on his lapse of faith when the famine was in the land to leave the land of promise to go down into Egypt and there were great consequences. And again, what a tragedy that when we in difficulties turn to the world as our first place to go for help rather than waiting on the Lord. That's always disastrous. There are always consequences to that. That's exactly what Abraham does here. And it's a big mistake. And so verse 2 of chapter 16 now, it says, And Sarai said to Abraham, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing, and I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah. God had named Abraham the father of the promised heir, right? Through him, all the nations were going to be blessed. He was going to give descendants to Abraham, but he'd not yet identified the mother. Logically, it would be Abraham's wife, Sarah. But perhaps God had other plans, and at least this is how they're reasoning. Perhaps he has other plans of how he's going to fulfill this promise to Abraham. And, and so Sarah ends up second-guessing God, and this is a dangerous thing to do. Maybe you've got another plan, Lord, and, and maybe it's to do with this handmaid. And, of course, true faith is based on the word of God, not on the wisdom of men trying to second-guess God, what he intends to do. And so certainly we see that there's some scheming going on here. And one of the things that I remember years ago hearing on the radio, faith is living without scheming. Oh, that's so difficult, isn't it? Faith is living without scheming. And so how they, unfortunately, uh, they get to scheming. And the solution proposed was an activity of the flesh, one that pointed to Hagar as the answer, not to God and his promise as the answer. Okay, here's how we're going to fix this. Hagar can be the solution to this problem. It was an Egyptian solution, a worldly solution. And note that Abraham listened to the voice of his wife. Notice again, end of verse 2, Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Does that give you any echoes from Eden? I think there's a distinct echo from Eden, isn't there? When Adam, <laughs> in fact, we can look at it, Genesis 3, and verse 17, we see this same thing. Now, it's not saying that we don't pay attention to our wives. I'm not saying that at all. We need to, uh, we need to be good listeners, men. I'm not you know, giving us a free pass here. But when it comes to what God has said and what the missus says, if there's a contradiction, we listen to the voice of God. That's the big difference. Genesis 3:17. Unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And it's just been interesting, just as in a side note, I've been doing quite a bit of preaching on bad advice recently. And invariably, every example has been advice from a wife. And I, I don't know why that is, but uh, I was think, preached recently on Herod's wife, have nothing to do with this just man. And oh, what a disaster it would be to have nothing to do with that just man. Everybody has to have something to do with that just man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyway, verse 3, it says, Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, 
and let me just suggest this. I think it might have been easy for Abraham to listen to the voice of his wife, because I suspect that Hagar was young and beautiful. And Abraham, great man of faith, was also a man. And so when his wife suggested this, uh, I think uh, he was pretty excited about the prospect. And so it says that he took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and Abraham had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. Now, this was kind of a cultural practice in those days that you could take uh, uh, your maid uh, to be a surrogate mother for a barren wife because the whole idea of being fruitful was so important. So there was this idea, and apparently even the details of it are well known from ancient documents. And certainly we would see that later on uh, that uh, you, you have the case of Jacob marrying his wife's maids, Bilha and Zilpah. And of course, each would give him two sons. And so in each case, it seems to work, like it seems to be successful. But unfortunately, in all the incidences, they didn't all live happily ever after. Because when we resort to the flesh and worldly methods, although it may initially seem to have a measure of success to it, the long-term uh, consequences are huge. And so it's interesting that polygamy in the Bible, um, <clears throat> there's not a single instance that I know of in scripture where it actually produces a happy home. There's always a spirit of competition. There's always home tension. Uh, it's never a good thing. And so, uh, we, again, Sarah's plan was one more example of the futility of human efforts to achieve God's blessing. They're trying to help God out. And it was hatched, uh, a plan that was hatched out of impatience on Sarah's part. And again, we've got to remind ourselves how restless our sin natures are. We're restless. We, we, want to, we want to give God a hand. We, want to, we, we find it so hard to wait for him to answer. So we'll, we'll try and come up with schemes. And it was a scheme to make things happen instead of waiting on the Lord. And so it says in verse 4, he went to Hag in, in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. So the plan seemed to be successful. For Hagar indeed did conceive a child, and perhaps Sarah was right after all. But not everything that is legal, at least in the culture of the day, or that appears to be successful, is approved by the will of God. And we see a similar kind of thing done all the time. A church uh, or a child of God is barren. There's seemingly no blessing no fruit. And instead of waiting for God, Hagar is brought in. Some worldly expedient is adopted, and it seems to get results, but of course the wrong kind. And I would say much of Christianity, instead of falling on our faces before God because of the dire condition of present evangelicalism, we're looking around for some quick fix program, usually of a worldly type, to, to get success. And it seems to give success for a time, but it's really not of God. And so <clears throat> it results in this case in family feuding. And we see that. It says uh, she had conceived her mistress was despised in her eyes. And what happened was that there was a, a bit of pride that crept into the heart of Hagar and she looked down on her mistress who was barren and was kind of gloating a bit in her fruitfulness. And so there's, there's this, uh, this pride, a bit like the story of Hannah and Penina, if you remember that story in 1 Samuel, very similar kind of attitude. And so, and if, again, just to read a verse from Proverbs, that would uh, just say the, the, the folly of what Hagar was doing here, it was really not a wise thing on her part. But again, it's flesh. Everything's flesh in this chapter. There's an awful lot of flesh. Uh, Proverbs 30 and verse 21, uh, it says this, 
for these things the earth is disquieted. In other words, these things cause a stir on the earth, and for fall which it cannot bear. For a servant when he reigneth, and a fool when he is filled with meat, for an odious woman when she is married, and a handmaid that is heir to her mistress. Just interesting, right? Handmaid that's heir to her mistress. In other words, she's got heirs and graces, and she thinks she is the one uh, who should be treated uh, properly. So there's a conflict in the family. And of course, later on, the apostle would take this up in Galatians and show that this illustrates the conflict between law, which is very much a flesh-driven system, and grace, which is entirely dependent on the Lord. And so he'll use that uh, to The two just cannot get on together. It's impossible. Law and grace are like oil and water. They don't mix. They're just not, it's not possible. And so verse five, it says, in Sarai I said unto Abraham, my wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid unto thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. And Abraham said to Sarai, I behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. So Sarah's frustration led her to treat Hagar harshly. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, how neither Abraham or Sarah are behaving very well in this stressful time. <laughs> and the Bible, one of the wonderful things about the Bible is it often shows its best characters at their worst moments. And uh, there was a famous painting many years ago of Oliver Cromwell, and you probably heard this, but uh, Cromwell was concerned that the artist would paint the picture warts and all. In other words, don't brush over, don't uh, you know, make it look, me look more handsome than I really am, just do it accurately, paint it warts and all. And that's one thing that the Bible does. It, it shows us our heroes, but they're, they're men with hearts of, of iron, but feet of clay. And we see the best of men are men at best. And it's kind of interesting background, isn't it? That all these great men of God all had their failings. And there's only one man on the pages of scripture that there's no fault to be found in him. That perfect man, the son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Abraham's solution now that we've got this domestic mess going on, is to basically give in to his wife and abdicate spiritual headship in the home and say to her, okay, you decide. What he should have done as he's witnessing the brutal treatment of this handmaid by his wife, he should have called them all together to the altar and they should have been reconciled and dealt with things in the presence of God and even confessed their failure. But no, Hagar, uh, so it basically Abraham just gives it into Sarah's hands. And so as a result of that, it says, when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And again, another solution that we often come up with when we're in messes is we try and run away from our problems. And it's amazing. I think never before has there been a runaway generation like our generation. The problems in the assembly, you run away. You just go somewhere else. That's the easiest way to deal with it. Problems in the marriage, yeah. Just divorce or get another one. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying that is, that is what happens in our culture rather than working through difficulties. And I don't think there's any couples that have not gone through difficulties in their married life, but the ones that have worked through them, it's amazing how their marriage is so much strengthened rather than just bailing out. And what you find is when people quickly bail out, when they go and get immediately into another relationship, and because they've never dealt with problems the last time, as soon as the difficulties, they're out again. And it just is a culture of immaturity that refuses to deal with issues and always runs away. And so this is exactly what she does. She runs away. Uh, and again, Abraham should have dealt with this, should have brought them together, should have had pity because this woman is also pregnant as well as um, being treated badly. But she runs away, does Hagar, and of course, Adam and Eve 
did the same thing. They ran and hid from God. But we soon discover that you can't solve problems by running away. Abraham learned that when he fled to Egypt, it wasn't a good solution for him to flee the land, to go to Egypt. And it still has repercussions to this very chapter. And so <clears throat> just a, another aside on Sarah, we often read in the New Testament, for instance, 1 Peter 3, Sarah is set before us as the perfect example of a submissive wife, even calling her husband Lord. And it's amazing. That's true of her. But she also had her moments. And this is one of her moments where she wasn't the sweet, submissive Sarah that we've come to think of, but she was tyrannical and she was treating the maid terribly. And so, again, we have to recognize that all of us, if we're really honest, and that's what's often lacking in evangelical circles, is that we, we put on a front and we pretend that we're all perfect. And the Bible doesn't allow that. It says, no, this is, these, are, these are the heroes. This is Sarah. Yes, yeah, she's a great example. But I'm not hiding the fact that there was a time when she was acting like a tyrant in her own home. And so it's good, I think, just to, I find it refreshing to, to just be real. That's what God looks for, reality in the inward parts. He wants, wants us to be real. And so <clears throat> verse 7, this is where we get to the, the well part. It says, the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water. Now, it's kind of interesting that, so this obviously was a well that, that was a springing well. It obviously had water coming up from it, like a, we call it an artesian well, something like that, because he, she calls it a well later on, and it's a different word in Hebrew. I checked it in verse 14, wherefore the well was called Bilaheroi, but here it's, she found a, he found it by a fountain of water. So it's a well, but it's, it's a well that's got a bubbling up water in it. And so it tells us that this is a spring that was on the way to Shur, or in the way to Shur. And that tells us a little bit, because Shur was actually on the way to Egypt. And if you, you want proof of that, look at Genesis 25, just for a second, and verse 18. Genesis 25, verse 18, it says, And they dwelt from Havila unto Shur, that is before Egypt, as thou goest towards Assyria. And he died in the presence of all his brethren. And so to sure that is before Egypt. So I think what she was doing is she says, I've had enough of this. I'm going home. I'm going back to Egypt. And of course, that would be the nat natural inclination, right? I'm going back to mama. I'm going home. I'm not going to be treated like this anymore. I'm heading home. And so off she goes. And yet, amazingly, the Lord meets her there. And again, we said this is the first time in scripture that we have this statement the angel of the Lord found her. And of course, we, we believe that these Old Testament appearances of the angel of the Lord are Christophanies. They are uh, an appearance of God's messenger, because that's the word angel, the messenger of Jehovah. And I believe that God's messenger in the Old Testament was the pre-incarnate eternal son the lord jesus taking on the form as it were of an angel coming and appearing to men now we'll see that as we continue with our studies but i want us just to recognize verse 10 the angel of the lord said to her i will multiply thy seed exceedingly that it shall not be numbered for multitude so the angel is promising to do something that only god can do right i'm going to multiply I'm going to, he says, I said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And then in verse 13, she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, thou God seest me. So clearly, she's calling the angel that appeared, thou God seest me. So he's called God. And in other appearances, uh, in Judges chapter 6, for instance, where he appears to Gideon, this angel of the Lord. Again, he, he receives worship. And so clearly this is a divine person. And I have no question in my mind that the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is the appearances of the one who ever was the revealer of the Father. In the Old Testament, he appeared as the angel of the Lord to reveal the Father to, 
to bring the message from the father as it were as the messenger of the lord and then in the new testament he's the one that fully told him out and that revealed the father in fullness so the angel of the lord found her and of course <clears throat> It says, by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid. It's interesting how he never once calls her Abraham's husband. Every time he speaks, it's Sarah's maid. Uh, later on, it will be the bond maid or the bond woman. Um, but he never calls her or uh, agrees that this is the, the husband, should he say, of Abraham, never says that, not once. So he said, <clears throat> um, he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? Now, again, is it that the angel of the Lord didn't know where she was coming from or where she was going? Uh, it's just, just like in Genesis, when the Lord says to Adam, where art thou? Did he not know where? You know, was, was Adam hiding, hiding so well that God didn't know? No, <clears throat> or Cain, where is your brother? And so when the Lord asks these questions, where are you, all this kind of thing, what he's doing is giving the person an opportunity to tell the truth and to be honest about where they are. And so that's why the Lord does that. And so that question is asked. Uh, and <clears throat> where, where, whence camest thou, whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. So at least she's honest about what she's doing. And so it says, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply thy seed. No, sorry, verse nine, jumping ahead. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to thy mistress, submit thyself under her hands. This is not an easy message, is it? Like it was a very difficult situation. She was treated harshly. And yet he says, return and submit. And that's a message, by the way, that there are many rebels that are running away from circumstances and running away from God. And God's message by the spirit of God would always be the same. Return and submit. Specifically to the Lordship of Christ. Return and submit. But that's the message that the angel delivers to her, return and submit thyself under her hands so obviously god intends to do something here he's going to be obviously going to be working in her heart to get her willing to go back and he's also going to be working in sarah and abraham's heart to receive her back because when she was in the family circle it was domestic it wasn't domestic bliss it was difficulty there was contention so she's kicked out and so to receive her back is going to be a working done in all of them but i want us just to, to just be I guess, staggered at this fact that the Lord who appeared to Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees because he loved him, appeared to Hagar as she was going towards Shur, found her and revealed himself to her. And isn't it amazing that this distressed woman who wasn't part of the promised people, she, she's from Egypt, and yet the Lord goes out of his way to see her and even to make promises to her and to encourage her to return. And I just find that amazing description of the grace of God. Just the same as the Lord Jesus, when he says in John's Gospel, chapter 4, he must needs go through Samaria. You remember how the Jews viewed the Samaritans? Absolutely despised them. And yet the Lord Jesus loved that woman and met her at the well of Sychar. He must needs go through Samaria because of the, that appointment. And so here we've got something of the heart of God that is bigger than just Israel. It's reaching out to an Egyptian maid. It's reaching out to a despised Samaritan woman. And this is the wonderful grace of, of God, isn't it? That it would reach out to people like this who are, who are outcasts, despised. Outcast. She was an outcast completely, not wanted. And yet the Lord goes after her and reveals himself to her. And I find that a very wonderful thing. And she did return. And obviously she, it, this encounter must have really affected her because she went back to the place where she'd been treated terribly. She, she responded. She did return. She did submit herself to Sarah. 
and no doubt went back and apologized for being arrogant and for, de for despising her mistress and for running away. And so no doubt there was a lot of amends made. And the reason was she'd met the Lord at the well. And when we meet the Lord, a lot of changes take place. And, and we, we seek to go and put things right from the past and, and get right with people that we once had enmity with. And it's a wonderful thing. Salvation is a wonderful thing because it changes people, their attitudes, their ways, everything about them. And so she does return. And of course, we, we said we never solve problems by running away, but we submit to God and trust him to work things out, even if it doesn't look good. And so verse 10, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not num be numbered for multitude. So a, a promise to her that she is going to, just as a promise was made to Abraham, that he was going to have descend multitude of descendants. Now, Hagar is also going to have multitudes of descendants. In verse 11, we get a little bit of a, a window into what her descendants are going to be like. And so it says, and the angel of the Lord said unto her, behold, thou art with child. Now, again, just think about this. This angel knew everything about this woman. He knew she was Sarah's maid. He knew that she was with child. And again, you imagine her, the shock that she meets a stranger in the desert who, and often angels just appeared actually in human form. And yet this person tells her all these details about her life that she's with child. And, and not only that, even things that she herself didn't know. She didn't know that it was going to be a son. She probably hadn't been to the hospital yet to get tested whether it was going to be a boy or a girl, right? Uh, because they didn't do that in those days. So the, the angel knows what sex it will be. It's going to be a, a son. And also what name this boy will be called. Thou shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And again, I want us to just camp on this idea. The Lord has heard thy affliction. Isn't that a wonderful statement? God has heard your affliction. So here's this woman in distress. Uh, she's not part of the, the covenant community, so to speak. I mean, she's, she's an outcast. She's an Egyptian. And yet God hears her distress and comes to her. And I just wonder, you know, isn't it a comfort to know that in this world, there's a lot of distressed people in our world right now. And the Lord is not oblivious to their cries. This is, this is the God of the Bible. He's sensitive. He, he, he feels it. He feels the, uh, the, the concern about this child in her womb. He's concerned about the child in her womb. He's concerned about her. And this is, this is the heart of God. And we've got to keep coming back to what the Bible reveals about the heart of God. And so it says concerning this son, okay, he's going to be Ishmael because the Lord has heard thy affliction. And of course, if uh, Ishmael has the idea of thou God seest me, which is a, kind of an amazing context and background. And so verse 12, he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. He shall dwell in the pres presence of all his brethren. So not a flattering description. <laughs> uh, he's going to be a wild man. It kind of identifies him with the wilderness where he would uh, spend his time and develop his skill as an archer. Uh, we see that in chapter 21, for instance, just for a moment, looking ahead. Genesis 21, verse 20 and 21. It says, and God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. And so, again, we we see something of that in skilled archer, wilderness man. It also revealed something of the in, independent and pugnacious nature of Ishmael and his descendants. And of course, some translations have the idea of a wild ass of a man, not just a wild man, but a wild ass of a man. Job talks about a wild ass in the desert in chapter 39. And the idea is he's portrayed in scripture as uncontrollable, independent, uh, noble, proud, but, but independent and certainly difficult to deal with. And so 
In short, we could say this, his descendants would be fiercely independent and warlike nomads. And of course, the history of his Arab descendants is a story of a proud people with a tradition of disputes. And by the way, a man who would claim to be a prophet called Muhammad would be a direct descendant of Ishmael. And we can see some of the outworking of this promise in the scriptures right here. And so she called, verse 13, the name of the Lord that spake unto her. And isn't it amazing? This is, this is, we should be staggered at this. The Lord spoke to her. Just like the Lord spoke to the Samaritan woman, the Lord spoke to her. And she, she, she called the name of the Lord that spoke to her. Thou God seest me. And it's almost like she's amazed. You see me, you see who I am, you see my circumstances, and yet you speak to me. And I think she's just staggered at the grace of God that he would do that to someone like her. Thou God seest me. For she said, have I also here looked after him that seeth me. So not only has God seen her, but she believes she's looked upon God. And often when people looked upon the Lord, they, they were staggered that they were still alive because they knew who God was. And so here she is in this amazing situation. And so she says, wherefore the well was called Bela Heroi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And it literally means well of the one who lives and sees me. And again, just a reminder to us, I don't know what we're going through, what distresses that are, that are going on in our lives right now. I have no idea what got a little glimpse of some of the distresses from the prayer list. Obviously, people are going through difficult times. But isn't it good to know that the Lord sees this, that the Lord hears the cries of the afflicted, and, and the Lord is, is interested. He's, he's the one who lives. He's the living God, and he sees me. And he cares about my estate, just as he cared for this woman and goes out of his way to give encouragement to her. And how is he going to do that with us? Well, I think the well gives everything away. It's going to be through the word of God and the spirit of God applying the word of God to our lives in our difficult circumstances that will bring hope and refreshment and encouragement in the midst of trials. It always is that way. And so it says that Hagar bare Abraham a son. Abraham called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. And Abraham was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to him. And it's interesting that as she goes back, there's no further mention of family conflict for many years in the Genesis account until Isaac was weaned. In other words, he'd stopped breastfeeding. And Ishmael became an the, the trouble causer there, he initiates the trouble, which results once again in the expulsion of Hagar. But even then, the Lord would meet with her once more in the wilderness. And so, again, I just as we consider this subject of the wells, I think it's important for us to realize that the Lord sees. I'm so glad that he sees us and that he knows the afflictions that we're going through and that he does have a means of refreshing us in our plight, in our wilderness journey. And that refreshment comes through the word of God as it is, as it were, applied by the spirit of God that gives us hope and the ability to press on and go back into the situation and submit to him and allow him to work. This is what God wants to do in our lives. And so I believe there's a lot of good lessons for all of us in this. And of course, some warnings too. Beware of acting in impatience, beware of helping God out, beware of going to Egypt for help and trying to, as it were, engineer things. Trust the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge him. <laughs> Don't lean on your own understanding. This is the challenge for us in our distressing days we find ourselves in. Let's pray. Our Father, we do give you thanks for the wonderful word of God. And we pray that, that just even this portion about the well might prove to be some encouragement to someone uh, that's listening uh, this evening, Lord, as we're, it's certainly been an encouragement to my heart and, and a challenge and a rebuke uh, to think about this chapter even today. Uh, Lord, again, forgive us when out of impatience, 
we've tried to help you out, uh, that we've got to scheming and manipulating and, uh, and maybe even had some results that look good. But deep down, we know it was flawed. It wasn't right. It wasn't honoring to you. Lord, we're reminded those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll rise up with wings of eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. Lord, help us in these things, we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.